the information about DNA about in one liter of water, you know, one, one soft drink bottle of, uh, of uh, refreshment is equivalent to what you get from sieving with a net, with a giant trawl net, 66 million liters. Hi, I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at academicinfluence.com and Wake Forest University. And today we have the pleasure of having Professor uh, Jesse Ausubel coming from New York City um, to tell us a little bit about how he got interested in his field of study. So Professor Ausubel, can you tell us a little bit about how it all got started when you were younger? Hi, Jed. Uh, I, I liked geography, maps, globes, uh, atlases, almanacs very much when I was a boy. Uh, I liked uh, math and science. Uh, I loved the oceans. Uh, my family would spend summers uh, by the sea. Uh, but I wasn't a person who had a strong sense of vocation. When people asked me what I would be when I would grow up, I, I didn't have an answer. When I applied to college, uh, uh, I wrote, I, I said I was undecided about what I would be. And it was really only my senior year in college uh, when I read an excerpt from a book about super tankers in the New Yorker magazine that I really said, hey, this is really the kind of thing I'm interested in. Uh, uh, and uh, I still, I'd say, uh, wandered around after that for another two or three years. Uh, in graduate school, I had a job as a research assistant working on uh, for an multidisciplinary group of faculty interested in different uh, problems of the oceans. And as soon as I started doing that work, uh, I was very excited about it and liked it. And uh, finally, at age 27, I got my first real uh, job, uh, a fellowship uh, at the National Academy of Sciences funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, but not to work on the oceans. I had submitted an application uh, for the fellowship saying I would work on problems of the oceans, oil spills, which were very much uh, salient at that time. But when I went down to uh, Washington, D.C. in the fall of 1977, the two people who were my assigned mentors said, well, many people are working on oil spills and problems of the oceans, but there's another problem that very few people are interested in that might be important. And I said, what's that? And they said, uh, climate. And I said, well, I don't really know anything about climate. And they said, well, you have two years of this fellowship and you can, you're can you supposed to learn and grow. I, I disappeared for about six weeks with a lot of articles, reports uh, to read. It came back and uh, this was again the fall of 1977. And I said, well, it seems like everything needs to be explored and analyzed and developed uh, in this field. So I became in the late 1970s, one of the f first, literally first handful of people around the world employed full time, paid a salary to work on the now crazily popular problem of uh, climate change. Back then, it must have been a completely different emphasis. In fact, I've heard that people were worried in the 70s about some sort of an ice age coming along. And people had suggested, well, maybe if we burn fossil fuels, we'll be able to stave off uh, the colder temperatures. So what was it like back then? Well, the in fact, the temperature of Earth uh, went down from about 1940 to the early 1970s. So there was a quite vocal group of people, very respectable uh, professors at the University of Wisconsin and in, in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, uh, who were concerned about a new ice age. Uh, and uh, the early 70s had some very bad harvests in the Soviet Union. Uh, the US sold grain and Canada as a result. Uh, and there were concerns at the very legitimate concerns at that time that, uh, that we were on the road to cooling. There were also voices based on projections and modeling, not the actual trends, saying, well, that could be true in the short run, but over the long run, the, the warming will really be the big problem. So when I started, I would say it was really quite, there was a very broad spectrum of views. It was not the, the situation we have today. And of course, there were people who were agnostic as well. Uh, it was really only uh, in the late 80s that the, that the people very, uh, uh, convinced about warming uh, came to came to dominate the debate. And it was really only in the late 80s, early 90s when uh, actual 
uh, climatology and data from uh, from the records uh, 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 of the atmosphere really began to to support the the models and the theory. Mm. And and when did you go from those two years of studying climate change and climate science to counting fish? Is is how you you know t- tell you you know what you do now? Um, so what, how did that all happen? Well, I spent about ten years really with climate as my central interest, and. By the late 80s, I felt uh, we'd gone from a situation where climate was a small village and everybody was friendly and interested in attracting new people to a place where the field was very big and competitive and frankly, uh, already ugly. Uh, And so I felt I'd made a contribution and uh, I'd always been interested in the the oceans. Uh, The the interest in biodiversity had grown enormously in the course of the decade of the 1980s, uh, along in parallel with the interests in uh, climate and other environmental problems. And uh, one day in the 90s, I was sitting with a wonderful colleague, Fred Grassley, uh, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, the Oceanographic Institution. And I said, Fred, could you give me a list of all the known forms of life in the ocean? And he said, well, I'd like to, but there is no such list. And I said, how is that possible? You know, people have been interested in in marine life for 3,000 years. How can there not be a list? And he said, well, you know, the squid people may have a list and the fish people may have a list and the sponge people may have a list. But in fact, within each group, people are arguing about what there is and they can't agree to put them together. And uh, the oceans are very big, so they're actually large parts of the oceans, 90%, 95% that we've never surveyed. So this led to a conversation, the outcome of which was Fred and I said, well, let's let's actually try to go out and conduct the first ever global census of marine life and really, uh, really address the problem very directly, not just do liter- literature reviews, but have thousands of expeditions uh, and thousands of people actually going out using all the methods available, uh, uh, fish finders, acoustic sonars, nets, uh, 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 genetics, uh, all the possible scuba divers, cameras. Uh, and uh, it took us about three years to go from uh, the idea, the vision, to a place where we actually had some core funding and uh, a framework to do it. And then from 2000 to 2010, uh, we conducted the first ever global census of marine life. Amazing. And so what would you say was the big finding from those 10 years and from all of your hard work? I would say first, uh, we did discover more than 5,000 new forms of life, and we were able to make the first ever list of about 230,000 known forms of marine life, uh, including mollusks and, and octopus and all sorts of things. Uh, so simply, I would say the catalog of diversity was uh, a very big contribution. Uh, the uh, uh, the connectivity also was uh, was uh, uh, really evident from from the the sum of the studies. We were organized into seventeen different teams: an Arctic team, an Antarctic team, a seamount team, an abyssal plains team, a coral reefs team. Uh, and uh, at the start, you know, it, there was sort of this: well, if I'm a tuna person and you're a squid person, I don't. Uh, you know, the, the squid people would say, well, I don't really like you tuna people because your animals eat my animals. And I would say there was a lot of uh, isolation, a lot of compartmentalism. And the the census itself, I think, created much more unity in the f- overall field of marine biodiversity, marine ecology, uh, and le- led to many findings about uh, of, of importance about uh, relatedness, interconnectedness, uh, uh, interdependence. Mm. And and so has there been continued sort of camaraderie after 2010? And has this spilled over into further projects for the ocean and perhaps also uh, a model for doing census, senses, whatever you call them, uh, in other areas like, um, you know, a land census of land animals or, or something like that? People have been interested since the mid 1980s in doing what are called all taxa biological inventories. Sometimes people will say from ridges, mountain ridges to reefs and into the deep sea. Uh, so the our census of marine life was part of this movement to try to assess the planet's biodiversity as a whole and to contribute to a better sense of whether there are 1 million or 10 million or 100 million 
uh, forms of life on the planet that earn a Latin binomial like Homo sapiens uh, for different species. Uh, the census of marine life itself left a strong legacy of communities of, of uh, for example, the community of people who give cell phones to animals that do that uh, tag and track animals. Uh, and we did fantastic uh, mapping of the movements of, of animals. The animals are amazingly cosmopolitan, in fact, and, you know, a tuna will swim from the Caribbean, from Cuba to Sicily, uh, or from Florida to uh, Norway, uh, or a seabird will fly from New Zealand to Alaska. So there, we did a tremendous job, for example, with that. In general, we did well with, with the distributions, the movements, and we did well with the diversity. But in the original census, we had a lot of trouble with abundance, how many of each species or how many kilos of each species there are. And just now, in 2020, I think we're finally seeing the way forward in that. And my own group here at Rockefeller University, led by a fantastic geneticist, uh, Mark Stokel, uh, we've been very active in developing techniques, sieving DNA from seawater, loose DNA, environmental DNA or extracellular DNA, eDNA. Uh, when animals swim, if, if you had a few swim in the ocean or your daughter swims in the ocean, you'll shed DNA. Uh, if we get a lot of it, we might be able to say it's Jed or Jed's daughter, Karina. But if we get just a tiny bit, we can say it's a Homo sapiens. And so we've known about this uh, loose DNA for a long time, but we didn't have a reference library. And over in the census marine life and since then, we've built up the reference library in GenBank and the other genetic databases of the different forms of life. And as a result, uh, we can now sieve the DNA and compare it, let's say, for fishes against that uh, database and uh, uh, make good matches. The amazing thing, which we will, Mark and our colleagues will publish uh, in the next month or so, the paper has been accepted for publication in the Journal of Marine Science, is that the number of pieces of DNA in the water also correspond to the kilos or biomass of the fishes. So if there are a lot of little pieces of bluefish, uh, it means there are a lot of kilos of bluefish. Or if there are a lot of anchovies, there are a lot of, an a lot of anchovy DNA, a lot of anchovy fish. If there are just a little bit of sturgeon, it means there you know, may be a lonely sturgeon. So the, this one, the information about DNA about in one liter of water, you know, one, one soft drink bottle of, uh, of uh, refreshment is equivalent to the, what you get from sieving with a net, with a giant trawl net, 66 million liters. That's like a football stadium up to the level of uh, the top of the goalposts, one to 66 million. So that means we can go out and take lots of samples, collect a lot of liters of water, put them through a filter. It's sort of, you know, squeeze the water through like a big hypodermic needle. You're left with a, a filter with some sediment, get the DNA out of that sediment, compare it to the database. So we think in the next decade, the abundance question uh, can finally be addressed thanks to genomics, together with, of course, still acoustics and optics and trawls, you know, the, because each method has its has its strengths and special richness. Mm -hmm. That is so fascinating. And what would you say is therefore your biggest contribution from the beginning of your career until the end, since you've worked on a, a number of different things? What do you think that people know you the most for? I've spent about ha I spent about half my time as a, a working stiff, as an analyst and writing papers and responding to reviews and uh, doing all the, 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 regular, the regular work, uh, you know, that leads to uh, publications, technical publications. But I've spent about half of my career organizing and managing large uh, observational programs. So a, a lot of people know me for having, having designed and organized uh, the World Climate Program, the Global Change Program, uh, more recently, the Deep Carbon Observatory, the International Quiet Ocean Experiment. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, I, I'm a person who's, uh, on the one hand, continued a 43-year career now of 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 making observations and doing doing analyses and writing up the results, and you know, working in a small group that does that. And then being part of these large global networks of hundreds and thousands of people 
uh, trying to do uh, uh, observation of the world as it is. I'm not really an activist or an advocate. I mean, of course, I'm very concerned about penguins or, or whatever. But really, I would say what I'm good at and what I've been good at is uh, is helping catalyze, organize, conduct these these large programs that, that actually provide the information about the world as it is. How many fish are there? What's the temperature? Uh, uh, how much carbon is uh, in deep earth, those kinds of questions. Mm. Well, thank you so much for uh, explaining a little bit about your career. It was fascinating. And uh, I really appreciate you taking this time today. Thank you. Jed, thank you and, and good luck to the new site.